Hello, guys. Welcome to the show again, where we are discussing Doctor Who. Um, and today, I'm really delighted to have my guest with me. By God, his resume of just Doctor Who alone is really big. You know, he's covered... Um, I think he's the only person who's actually covered uh, classic Who, as well as New Who when it came back in 2005 as a director. So we've got an awful lot to talk about. Um, and I'm, I'm really pleased he's here with me. So will you please welcome uh, Graham Harper? How are you, Graham? Oh, thank you very much, Frank. I'm very well. Thanks very much. Oh, that's great. Graham, uh, okay, let's let's start from kind of like from your early beginnings, really. Um, what was your aspirations when you were younger? Were you always interested in in filmmaking? Did that was that kind of where you wanted to go? And did you and did you study filmmaking at school or anything like that? So uh, <laughs> here we go. <laughs> so I was born um, and lived in Boreham Wood. I wasn't born in Boreham Wood, but I I was born in St Albans. I lived uh, for most of my youth. Uh, in Boreham Wood in Hertfordshire. Now, Boreham Wood, um, for since the 30s, I think it was since the 20s, had major film studios, never mind Pinewood and Shepperton. Boreham Wood had, I think, nine studios, film studios, the, um, MGM, ABPC, Douglas Fairbank Studios, Charlie Chaplin had a studio there, to name but a few. Um, so I was in an environment, I didn't meet stars in the street or anything, but I was in the... I was very aware that we were living in a film world. My father, from the age of probably five or six years old, to my age, I was five and six, not him, um, <laughs> he took me to the cinema twice a week for as many weeks as you can think of in a year. Um, so I must have seen throughout the first 10 years of my, uh, from the age of five to 15, I must have seen 2,000 films. Um <laughs> Can you imagine? Uh, I, no, I, didn't have a I, I don't think I've even seen 2,000 films in my life. <laughs> I've well, seen a lot, but I couldn't count. I mean, it's, you know, it's possible we, to know how many. But, you know, no, yeah. we, we, we saw together many movies. Um, my mother worked for RKO, who had a studio there. Ah. Uh, she was an actress. Um, when she met my father, she taught acting. Uh, and English, etc., um, and gave up acting professionally, but she also did amateur dramatics, um, um, won lots of awards for her performances. So I was in, I, and my sister was a ballet dancer, quite successful. So I could not escape um, theatre, film, and television, really. Um, I had, and I wanted, I, I was very attracted by it. I went to drama, I went to a drama school eventually because I was. Uh, well, there was a huge row. Uh, with, gosh, I'll start again. So my mother and father, at the age of nine and ten, thought that I should, if if I was going to have a good time in life, I should um, and get good work and whatever, I should speak properly, because I had quite a bad Cockney accent. You can right. still hear it. I still have an accent. But... I can still hear it. I can still hear it. Yeah. But I was sent to. <laughs> I was. I was sent to drama school on a Saturday morning, Italia Conti Stage School, which is a very famous stage school. I've heard of that. I've heard of it, and, yeah, yeah. And they did um, uh, education lessons um, for students who only... I was part-time. I was just there for an hour uh, every Saturday doing elocution lessons. But in 1955, ITV started, Rediffusion, I think it was called in those days, and um, they were doing a, a production for their first drama television program they were doing uh, uh the pitwick papers and there's a character called master bardell bright red hair and that was me with freckles uh in this story and uh, they went around all the drama schools looking for a, a likely character for that and the school asked my parents as i had bright red hair and freckles would they like me to be put up for this job um and, and they asked me if i would like to do that and i said oh that sounds good didn't it and um i was seen and guess what? I got the part. So um, I a week of I was already playing truant, and, truant quite a lot from school. So um, the the um, school inspector um, was on my case basically. <laughs> anyway, he happened to watch this program when it went out. It was the first drama ever on ITV, and he saw a little face under a wig I was wearing um, uh, that he recognised. This little scallywag is always playing truant. 
Um, and he checked the school records and I was off for a week at a certain time that the rehearsals were for this programme. Right. Uh, <laughs> and uh, the next thing was the programme had gone out and this school inspector came round to my parents' house or where we lived and said, what's going on? This little boy, that your son, has been seen as Master Bardell in this programme and we noticed he took a week off ill to rehearse. Um, this is not acceptable. And so my parents, my father had a huge row with this guy and he took me out of school, having asked Italia Conti if they would take me on on a grant because they couldn't afford to send me to drama school. And they did. And so that's how I started. So at the age of 10, nine or 10, I um, started at drama school. And for six years, I studied um, uh, drama and, and dancing. Um, and I had quite a successful career as a child actor from that age to 16. Wow. When I left drama school, um, I had terrible stage fright. Uh, so, th and theatre work was out then because I was yeah. terrified. I did did it, but I had I really hated theatre um, because I had a huge fright. I did not enjoy acting in front of people, I, but I loved television and film. That was smashing. Mm. So I decided not to accept any more theatre work um, if it was offered to me. Uh, I had an agent. And um, I begged them just to kind of concentrate on film and television, of which at that time there was not lots. So you can imagine I didn't do, I did do parts, but I didn't do, I didn't work every, uh, regularly. I worked probably three times a year. So I had to get other work. Um, and uh, I decided um, at one stage I was offered driving instruction to be a driving instructor in Borwood because I was, um, uh, close to the film studios and they got lots of work from people in the th studios so I said okay I'd love to do it not that I was going to I couldn't see the connection with me uh, as an actor uh, being useful as a driving instructor to people yeah. in the film but anyway that's what they thought and one day um, I taught a woman called Iris Rose and Iris was the secretary to somebody quite important at um, MGM anyway she passed a test with me um, as her instructor, she passed her test and I was driving her back to the studios to be paid. And she said, would you like to come in um, uh, so I can pay you upstairs? But um, and I'll show you the set. And I said, OK, well, it sounds smashing on the latest. Nice. Production that she's yeah. working. So I walked in. You're going to guess what this is. But I walked into the studios, uh, MGM, and it was a darkened studio. I mean, only the studio lights were on um, and I could see space modules and um, various connections with space go upstairs to her, the office above the studio and uh, she said oh Stanley this is Graham he's my driving instructor um, and he's quite interested in getting into film because we talked a lot about uh, film as you can imagine he said oh and how's my pupil how's your pupil doing and I said well she just passed a test he's all oh, how wonderful blah 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 and we had about a five minute conversation about what he was doing etc and it was Stanley Kubrick and when I <laughs> got paid and walked out, I went, yippee, yes. <laughs> that must have been and amazing, man. It was amazing to that me. That must have been amazing. Because yeah. he was famous already. By he's, he's one of my favourite directors, without a doubt. Oh, is he? Oh, incredible. I think he was. I think he was incredible. He was terrific. It, it, um, yeah. yeah. So I walked out. I was so... I had, And from that moment on, I thought... I, I've got to get back into the studio, but on the other side, I'm not going to act. I'm going to try and get production work and see if I can become a director. I was 21 years old when I did this. Uh, when, oh, I, yeah. when I said that, I, I, I'm going to become a director. But anyway, I wanted to go into production and see if I can, and get a job in production. So I wrote to everybody I could to get a job in television or film. And eventually I got an invitation to join, to go, well, to go to a BBC interview for a, a runner. Um, so at the age of 21, I was given the opportunity by the BBC to be a runner. And that's how I started. Fantastic stuff. So what would have been the first thing you would have worked on at that time? Um, remember? BBC, um, well, as a runner, I you they, the, in those days the BBC had studio management department, and studio management had floor managers um, uh, who did every kind of program possible, 
Uh, sometimes it was light entertainment, sometimes very rare it was a drama because in drama they had their own first, their own produ- uh, floor managers who saw the production off from the very beginning to the very end of it, as it were. Mm. Um, but there were all the other programmes like Maths for Today, um, uh, Panorama, Newsreel, and news programmes, etc. Um, uh, and uh, light entertainment uh, comedy series, they all had on a daily basis from an office uh, that specialised in those people. So you had a floor manager, you had, um, and you had uh, vision mixers. Yeah, they had the editors who put the show, you know, cut the cameras up during a program that's going out live, um, and runners, which were me. And runners are cool boys, and um, you your duties were to arrive. You were allocated to programs every day, so you might be doing a schools program one day, uh, a drama the next, um, a, a, light, a light entertainment, a news program, current affairs, football. It could be anything on a daily basis. You never knew quite what you were going to do. Um, Top of the Pops, in fact, was one of my favourite programmes, and I did that regularly for three years every Thursday or Friday whenever it went out it used to go out on Thursday and sometimes yeah, I think it was Thursday she used to go out yeah, yeah I think yeah. it was a Thursday it's ingrained yeah. in my brain yeah. um so that's so the very first program I cannot remember um but the first drama I did was Doctor Who and ah. it was the first week that Patrick Troughton played Doctor Who right well, that the very the first, first story week. he did, you mean? That's the very first story. But I didn't... Wow. I was the okay. senior runner on it. It was, there was somebody else, and I was learning the job. So I was trailing somebody. But I helped yeah. to put the names of people on their door for the stars, etc. and all the yeah. art. Um, you ran, you, your job was to go and collect things from different offices, graphics or uh, an artist from to go to makeup. You had a variety of tasks you had to do. You were the gopher, you know, the... Gopher, I think they, the Americans call them gophers, don't they? Gophers, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. you did a bit of everything, fetching coffee, fetching this, doing that. Absolutely. Calling the actors, I suppose, to come on set, things like that. Yes. Maybe, that kind of Make thing. Make sure yeah. they get to makeup, wardrobe, get them into the... Yeah, system. you had to do a bit of everything, really. Yeah. Uh, um. So what do you remember of that uh, uh, um, that 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 first Doctor Who that you you were on? Is there anything that sort of you remember about? I that? remember meeting meeting Annika Wills, Wilkes, who was yeah. beautiful. I mean, she still is a very attractive woman, but she was beautiful looking woman. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, and so nice. She was such a nice, lovely personality. She was lovely. I remember her, Michael Craze. Um, uh, who I got to know quite well in that period, but uh, yeah, and we were the same age really, so yeah. yeah, no, it was interesting. She was lovely. What about and Patrick Troughton? Yeah, he was. Well, it was interesting. I never met him uh, before or or with my family, but my mother used to do um, theatre plays at the Hartley Hall, which yeah. was an amateur dramatic uh, a hall that you, it was a local hall, but they used to do dra- our drama there. Uh, and my mother played many parts there. And Patrick was the, um, uh, what do you call it? He wasn't the sponsor, but he was, um, he sponsored the Hartley Hall, and the amateur dramatic society that my mother belonged to. So they knew each other very well. Um, and I told him that at the time. I thought my mum knows you, blah, blah. And he was quite surprised and pleased for me that um, Eileen Harper's son was now working in television. Did you ever sense even then? I know, I know you were, you were, you're you're very young. It's your first kind of like job on on the set at a TV, as it were, for an established show. Yeah. Because um, obviously, you know, William Hartnell was there before, you know. Uh, yeah. And uh, it was popular at that point. It'd been going for a few years. Did you ever sense any uh, um, anxiety from Patrick? Because it's his first story, stepping into, you know, new shoes here. Um, did did you notice anything at all? Um, no, not remember? at all. He was no. very. I mean, he was a giggler. He was a lot of fun, um, Patrick. But he was um, uh, also there was a very serious side to him about playing the roles. He was a very serious actor in terms of professionally being brilliant and being there and knowing his work and knowing his job. Yeah, and also very generous to the people he was working with. So, no, I didn't notice that at all, other than probably 
um, he had uh, nerves just before the red light went on for rehearsal, recording or whatever. But uh, no, I don't remember him being anxious. Yeah, that was his very first story. For you know, for anyone yeah. who doesn't know, that called the power of the Daleks. It was um, literally he just took take it just you know ch changed from William Hartnell into into him. Second, into the second Doctor. So you, wow, you you know. Uh, um, I didn't get that impression. You didn't get to see the transition. You didn't get to see the um, changeover. No, mm -hmm. not. I mean, I, I, I was, I was worrying about myself more than him. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, and I was very wide-eyed and um, uh, bushy-tailed. Really, I, I was more concerned about, wow, I'm here. You know, this is fantastic. Grab it. This is three months contract I had, uh, and I was going to make sure. Um, I knew something about everything at the end of that, so I could get a, a more permanent job. The wonderful thing about, I, I imagine, about doing running, starting like <laughs> that, you know, starting from the real, and and, and, the, and I don't mean this derogatory at all. Like, runners are incredibly important, you know, they're vital. Um, but you are at the lower rung, as it were, you know, of, of the studio uh, uh, work. Um, but it must have been a great training ground for you because you're you're like a sponge, you're absorbing everything, you're watching yes. everything. Must be a great way to kind of like you know to start in a sense. When I, I was doing it at the time, I mean, I wasn't thinking about this is my big steps to directing, but uh, no, um, no, no, I no. was. But what I what I realised at the time, within about two weeks of being there, I realised that I had a golden opportunity to understand very very much about the making of television not from a technical point uh, engineering point of view because i didn't understand any of that yeah um but the, the actual putting together and then seeing it made <clears throat> um yeah. on the floor as it were um but from a backroom point of view so i knew by the time i'd been there for three months I knew pretty well where every department was, where the head of makeup was and where the makeup department was, where wardrobe department was, um, where all the graphics were made. Cause I had to go to these places to pick people up or go. Right. Yeah. You would. Yeah. You would have got so. Yeah. Very so I that. got to know the donut as we called it, this big, huge television center. I got to know it and what was where, where the VT areas were, where they edited all the shows, etc. I got to know where everything was um, so, so you become invaluable to a production when it's in the studio because they didn't know often where everything was, but a yeah. producer and a director wouldn't necessarily know. Um, but you did. You knew how to go. So if they needed something fast to be got or to be taken to, you knew where to go and you could get it there fast. Yeah. Um, I wrote down here, uh, Graham, that uh, <clears throat> you came back to Doctor Who um, but you moved. You moved up. You've moved up the ladder. You know, somewhat uh, um, from runner to um, floor manager. Assistant floor manager. Uh, I have here. This. I think this is the the sequence that's happened. Correct me if I'm wrong. And you worked on them um, in that in that capacity. You worked on three stories starring John Pertwee as a Doctor, and I got Colony in Space. Planet of the Daleks and Planet of the Spiders. Yeah. Um, so how did you go from being a runner to becoming production, uh, uh, becoming assistant floor manager? How does that happen? So, um, so I after three months, I managed. I think it was three months. Might have been six months. I might have got another three month contract. Um, but I'd only been there half a year at least, and. Uh, I managed to go for an interview, which gave me permanency in running. I did. I was a runner for three years. And then in 1969, I knew. So what that gave me, the opportunity to see where I wanted to go, um, uh, where, I, uh, well, I, where I wanted to go, but where I would like to try to go to, which department did or what did I want to do in this in the production area? Um, <clears throat> so... Of course, you can see that I would uh, have worked with many different kinds of directors for that six months. And I knew that where I needed to be was drama in the drama department. I could have gone to I could have gone anywhere and tried to get anywhere. But I realized I needed to, I had I had the experience to go into drama. 
because uh, I'd done stage management uh, as a teenager uh, in productions in the theatre. So I decided that where I needed to go was drama. Um, <clears throat> they didn't have their own runners. That came from the pool from studio management. But they had assistant stage managers or floor managers um, who um, were like AFMs in the theatre. Uh, you know, they made props, they um, um, attended rehearsals, they ran the rehearsal rooms, they acted as the assistant in rehearsals to the director <clears throat> and the assistant to the first assistant, um, the, the the floor manager, the production manager with the... Um, BBC ran in a totally different way to film. So a production manager was like a f floor manager, but also the right-hand man of the director, so um, like in films. Um so I knew I needed to get into drama. Um, I applied for an assistant floor manager job um, several times, but by 1969, I managed to achieve um, a, a provisional job as an assistant floor manager in drama, drama serials. Um, drama in those days of the B was plays department, series department, that's like casualty, which is long running series, or serials, which were the six-part thrillers or the Fort Size Saga or whatever. So it's a one-off story, but in six parts or ten parts or whatever. Um, and I I applied for serials and I got a job. So I and in fact, I think that was a proper that was a the, the best department I could have gone to because the, the variety of shows they did, uh, so they had original drama, classic dramas, classic serials. Um, and and I found that really, really interesting and very diverse. <coughs> Excuse me. So but what was your experience like, you know, starting as a, a um, assistant floor manager at AFM uh, on th those those Doctor Whos, those Pertwee Doctor Whos that you um, did? But um, so by the time... Uh, so... So I've just got to remember what they were. So there was colony. Right. The first one seems to be from from what I've gathered online, and I think it's a reliable source. Uh, the first one was Colony in Space. Yes, that was Michael Bryant directing. That's right. Yeah. Who strange, lovely, uh, lovely Michael. Yeah. Michael had Michael. been at drama school, uh, my yeah. drama school. Uh, to he was two years my senior. I think he's a couple of years older than me. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> and he'd um. So we, I, I knew him. He knew me as a little squirt. At drama. <laughs> Sorry, I've got a bit of a cough. That's all right. You're, you're okay. Um, you're all right. But um, so he he'd gone off into production. He he acted for quite a bit of time, and then obviously became a director. But he was working at the Beeb when I joined. Yeah, uh, much more senior than me. Um, and by the time I got to that department, he was now a director. Um. So, but that was nice, uh, and he was a lot of fun to work with, uh, as well as the fact we knew each other a bit from school. Um, I didn't fraternise with him at school, but we had such a good time. Um, we really liked each other to this yeah. day. Still do. I mean, it's very mutual because um, I, I, I've spoken to Michael because I interviewed Michael as well. I was very fortunate to, to interview him quite recently. Uh, good, um, oh, quite right. And he's going around boating all around the bloody world now. Yes. He's got his yeah, own he, boat. He goes. He's in the Mediterranean. I, he was sitting in the Mediterranean while it was like raining and minus zero outside here. <laughs> and I'm going. I'm not one bit jealous, Michael. <laughs> you, <laughs> you bugger. You know, like <laughs> you know, yes. he's sitting there in the bloody med. You know, but you know, more power to him. He's a lovely man. You know. Yes. No. He's, and he's, he speaks very highly of you, Graham. By the way, oh, he I'm really so does. No, I, I mentioned I'd be talking to you, and he said, "Send, send him my love." Uh, he sends his love to you. Thank you very much. No, yeah. he's a very, very nice man, very and very good director. Um, yeah. So I went so with him. It, yeah. I remember uh, we recently did a a, a little documentary uh, about the making of um, variety of Doctor Who's, of which we've both been a part of at some stage, especially that one, which went. We had a visit down to the China clay pit that we filmed, the very famous clay pits. Yeah. Um, in Cornwall, uh, which are now fully covered in water. So they're huge lakes now, but in yeah. the days we were shooting there, it was a big China clay area. Um, so it looked like a, 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 a planet loonscape, as it were, like a, a, a moonscape of some sort, a very strange area to work in. Yeah. Very interesting. Um, I remember that very well because 
<clears throat> what I remembered about it was there were 12 of us, there were 12 stuntmen on that. Can you imagine 12 stuntmen? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how they had the budget for that back then. No, they did. Twelve, we, they 12 were, stuntmen. Yeah. There were twelve stuntmen. I don't <laughs> remember. Excuse and, me. Yeah. Um, uh, th th that was a lot of fun. Uh, a lot of funny stories from that, which I'm not sure I should go into. And um, it was a very, very pleasant experience. Really, really interesting. Uh, and I learnt a lot on that show. And I was given a lot of. Um, um, uh, I, it, Michael allowed you to be a part of his production, so you know it, by that I mean he he in, was interested in what you had to say and be a part of it and help him make his program. Uh, a big lesson, a really good lesson to learn. So he wasn't like a dictator. He was somebody who was saying he he asked people in to come and enjoy themselves to make the program with him. So it was really good. <coughs> Fantastic stuff. That's 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 great. Um, that's lovely when people, you know, you've got that camaraderie going. You know, it's very. No, important. he did. He was very. He was very, very, very important. That you know, to have a happy ship. You know, as a, yeah. for want of a better word, as he's on a, on a boat. You know, but it's true. Um, if if people are happy, work, you know, working, you get you get an awful lot more out of them. Yes, you know, absolutely. I find. Yeah, if you've got a happy campers, you know. Yeah. No, I uh, totally uh, agree with you. I think. Yeah. Um, I and think I'm sure you run it like that too, Graham. I, I can imagine you being the same. I, yeah. I I learned to. I wouldn't say mm -hmm. I did at the start of my career as a director. Um, yeah. I was too. I was too deep into what I was trying to do, um, but as you get experience and as you become more lucid about how to go about your job, um, I very much feel the same way that um, people should enjoy coming to work every day. Because you know, most most people. In regular jobs, as it were, I don't mean in entertainment, just regular nine to five jobs or whatever, are mostly bored up senseless, aren't they? They do it for the paycheck at the end of the week or the month, but there might not be anything that's really giving them any satisfaction, you know. I, so, uh, I, so you really want a happy environment. You want to be able to wake up in the morning and go, "I really, yeah, I'm really looking forward to going to work." But how many people are in that position, you know? I I have to say that's. Most of my life has been um, lucky in that way. I, I I can't imagine me working nine to five in, in stuck in an office. Um, whereas in film and television, you're out and about. You're yeah. You're at the time, you're on you're location or you're wherever you know. Or yeah. you're in a studio somewhere else. Sometimes yeah. in Birmingham or Scotland or whatever. It's yeah. it's full of variety. So for that, I'm very very grateful. Absolutely. Yeah, that's the, the wonderful thing. Uh, um, uh, so, you, you say so you you worked on Colony in Space. Any memories of Planet of the Daleks and Planet of the Spiders? Spiders was Pertwee's last story, by the way, before he turned into <coughs> Tom Baker. But the Dalek one, that, that, I think that was all studio. The, yeah, the, the, that was David Dalek. Maloney, wasn't it? I, I think, believe so. I think yeah, so. Yeah. I, I yeah. to be very honest, I don't remember that very well. I can remember yeah. working with him. I worked a lot with David. Oh, on different other productions uh, besides Doctor Who. Um, <clears throat> I remember um, Planet of the Spiders because that was um, Barry Letts as the director. Barry Letts, <laughs> yes, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> and um, that was very enjoyable because he also is a very enjoyable person to work with. And he runs his ship in the same way that Michael did. Michael may have got that from Barry. Yeah. Um uh, what I remember about that pro it was a very interesting uh, program. It was a very creepy story, um, but there was an incident in that that um, to do with the actual making of it that was um, really shocking, and and very very lucky that it, it had a good outcome. We had um, Barry asked me um, to, as an assistant floor manager. He asked me to check out. <clears throat> a, 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 a one man, um, I think it was a helicopter, a single seater helicopter, um, which was out in the open. There was a company in Teddington who made these things and he wanted them. He wanted, he fancied using one of these pro, uh, machines for the villain to get a, uh, be able to get away with, to fly off and, uh, and um, also for the doctor to chase the villain in a similar craft 
um, which is which is one of the action pieces of the story. So I located this company, um, found out all about them. They said yes, they would be very interested to bring their machine. Of course, they were because free advertising for new company. Um, so in the end, we had a contract with this company to come and offer these little vehicles that could be used to chase each other. Te I mean, in theory, um, in the air. Of course, the actors never flew these things for real because they couldn't. Um, so we had doubles for those. <clears throat> but um, on the day of shooting the villain running across an airfield and getting running away from the Doctor and various other people, getting into this helicopter that was all the rotor was going round on an airfield that i found odd but anyway that was the story and he ran across the field got into the cockpit of this plane and took well not plane helicopter and took off obviously there was a moment where we would cut away somewhere else so that the double could get in the chopper anyway the actor was running across the field to get all he had to do is to get into this thing uh, and look as though he was about to take off. But the rotor was going, so it was all fully active. But it had chocks stopping it from moving, these wooden wedges stuck under the wheels. So as he was running across, um, this thing, he, he was running across, but he was halfway across the field, and this helicopter suddenly started to move, and it turned round and started to look as though it was coming to chase towards the camera. And John, the actor, ran away from it, coming back to us. And the, luckily, the helicopter toppled, but it meant that the rotor then broke up into bits that were flying. I mean, can you imagine the rotor was going around probably a um, hundred times a minute or something? But anyway, it fell over and bits flew off it and came flying towards everybody. We all ducked. And the actor ducked too. Um, the thing broke and stopped. We ran over to the actor to see if he was OK, and he was. Got him up and brushed him down. And I noticed that a piece of his um, of the um, wood from the rotor had gone right through the back of his coat and come out the other side, but not through him. It, was, it, it just went through a fold of the clothes as he was running. He was very, very lucky, and so were we all, um, that it wasn't more serious than that. Um, and he got away with it, thank goodness, and... Uh, that's the, that's the story, but it was terrifying. Well, great night. That that is horrific. Oh, it could have been potentially horrific. It was know. it was a one yeah. of those things, but yeah. um, in terms, you know, it was securely chopped off. You thought, um, so it just shows you. I mean, we wouldn't get away. We would not have got away with that at all. Now that just would never happen. Oh, the health and safety now. Wow. Oh no, okay. be not in a million years. No. Um, you, but we all thought we were being safe and and careful. Yeah. But uh, it just shows you things can go wrong. Yeah, that's the thing. Yeah, yeah. God, that's that's. Wow, what a story. Yeah. Yeah, it was a bit um, terrifying. But uh, anyway, yeah. all was well. Nobody was hurt. Um, the helicopter was, but um, nobody. Yeah. Was hurt. And uh, uh, and I'm I, I'm sure the company uh, went on to do things. You know, I'm sure it did them some good, but um, not their machine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was pretty much wrecked. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, interestingly, now you, you, you again, you've kind of moved. You know, you've moved. Uh, you've done. Uh, you're doing a different kind of a <laughs> job, as it were, uh, um, as a production assistant. Um, so you've gone from assistant floor manager to a production assistant. What's the differences there, uh, Graham? What 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 what's the differences in duties and so on? Hold that thought. Um, okay. I so I did AFMing, assistant floor managing. Um, usually, you last about three or four years in that job before you're then given a promotion if you're lucky, um, and people have moved on um, to become the production manager. That's the same as a first assistant. Ah. It's the same job. It's just called production managing at the Beeb, or was then. Not now. That's all changed. But it was then. It was called production managing. Yeah. The reason it's called production managing, I think, is because you were first assistant director, location manager, and production manager in terms of running the budget um, that was allocated to your program. You were yeah. in charge of the budget. 
that also changed quite rapidly after I became a, a production manager. Um, but at that stage, that's what the job entailed. Um, <clears throat> so you usually assistant floor managed for three or four years uh, before you start applying for the promotion or going to script editing or whatever. Um, I was in the job for a good seven years. Uh, I could not get a job as a first. And eventually I went to see the head of department to say, please, please um, <laughs> help me become a first production manager. I don't know what I'm doing wrong. <clears throat> and the thing he said to me was, well, Graham, from your reports, we had annual reports every year, how good we were and we behaved ourselves and in order to get a raise in our salary. Um, he said, I've noticed over the last three years, you're still too youthful. You're having too much of a good time um, and you're not quite ready. You, you're not quite serious enough for us to make you into a first assistant production manager. And I I thought that was ridiculous. <laughs> what a ridiculous thing to say. I was having too much of a good time. Um, wasn't taking the job seriously is what I think they meant. Um, so I tried to change that. Uh, by becoming more serious, which is very difficult for me to do. Um, but the next year I applied for the job, um, I got it. Was a, it's a trainee job as a first. It wasn't like they weren't going to make me permanent. Uh, but I managed to get it. I managed to become a, uh, a first assistant director. Um, but it was seven years when it should have been a good three years earlier. Anyway, listen, I still enjoyed it. I was not going to leave because of that. I was going to stick it out until those buggers made me into a production manager. <laughs> in the end, I didn't get the chance. I was given it. And, and yeah. I, was, I, I never became bitter about it. Uh, I wasn't bitter about it while I was doing the job. I, I really enjoyed assistant floor managing, and I worked on some fantastic productions. I really had such... I mean, it was difficult not to have a good time. The people I was working with and the productions I was on were fantastic. I mean, one of them was uh, um, uh, was uh, War and Peace. It was one director, John Davis. It was twenty episodes. He did the whole lot, and we helped him. There were two two production teams who helped him by uh, by um, uh, you know I was in <clears throat> as an floor man assistant floor manager. I was doing one episode while the next one was planning and organising the next one, and so we rotated like that. But we were on it for two years. It was the most wonderful experience, and what you learnt on that show, every aspect yeah. of what you needed to make a television program, it was fantastic. So I I had no time to be bitter. I was really having such a good time doing it. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Uh, um. You work with you. You then you then worked with uh, um, on you worked on a couple of stories with Tom Baker as a doctor. Yes. Uh, 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 Seeds of Doom, and yes. uh, later, much later, towards his, the end of his reign, as uh, in uh, Warriors Gate. Warriors Gate, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, so, so, I'm sorry. Sorry, don't. Uh, yeah, but also it's just bef kind of before that, but well, before in production. I mean. In transmission order, maybe it wasn't in the same when you were in production order, but uh, um, there was a story called um, uh, the uh, Brain of Morbius, and yeah. uh, what's happened since in the, in the in the in the in the more recent Doctor Who? I'm sure you're aware of this, Graham. Uh, um, they showed all the doc all the doctors, uh, <laughs> you know, in sequence. Uh, uh, hmm earlier than uh, Hartnell and so on. And you're one of the faces <laughs> of, of a part, some, some unnumbered doctor. Um, so how do you feel being part of that kind of hi history now? Um, you know, <laughs> <laughs> you um, know? I thought I looked quite good. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was, I do remember vaguely having a photograph done. They needed, Nine, eight or nine uh, previous doctors or um, uh, incarnations, 
um, and I I was free one afternoon. He said, "Would you like to go down to the um, uh, such and such a studio where they're going to take photographs of a variety of people, directors, producers, and God knows who else?" Yeah. Um, uh, in different swashbuckling kind of gear and whatever. Um, and I don't know. I was in a cloak of some sort. I seem to remember. But anyway, um, I said, "Yeah, okay." So I popped down the road. They someone came and did my hair and a bit of makeup. <laughs> I was given a costume and had my photograph taken. Um, who would have known that uh, hundreds of years later that would become quite celebrity kind of moment? For yes, me. funny. I have been asked about it a lot, but uh, <laughs> I a photograph that was used uh, on a screen, I think, in, in a set somewhere. Very, very pleasant. I thought it was important to ask you that. I wasn't going to let that slide without asking. <laughs> It's a distant memory, but that would I would have been one of my regrets if I hadn't mentioned it, you know, <laughs> um, because it has come back into like the, the newer series. It's become kind of like um, part of the mythos now, I think, or something, yes. you know, yes, the, the, know. Those, doc those doctors, you know. Yeah, it was it was uh, talked about recently, I remember. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Funny. And you had other people like Philip Hinchcliffe was one of them. and uh, Yes, Dougie uh, Campfield. Uh, 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 Douglas Campfield. Passed on. Um, 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 Christopher um, Barry, people like that. Yeah. Christopher yeah, Barry. Chris Baker. Christopher Baker was one. Christopher Barry, wasn't it? Christopher Barry and Chris Baker. There's another director. Oh, Chris Baker, sorry. Who's also... Uh, and George Galaxio, I think, as well. Yes, George, yeah. Uh, 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 oh, and, um, of course, um, one of the greatest writers of Classic Who. Uh, um, oh, Lord, he, he wrote Graham something. Williams. I think he might have been in it as well. But Yeah, Graham was one of them, yeah. And I was thinking of... Uh, um, he wrote. He wrote Androzani. Oh, uh, um, um, Bob Holmes, Robert Bob Holmes. Holmes. Yes, of course. Yeah, yeah. Yes, he was absolutely amazing. Yeah, great, great writer. Yeah. Yes. Um, so there we are. You are part of. You are part of history now. I remember Good season that, two. You know? Yeah. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, I remember season doom because I had. It's where I had a chance to. Um, uh, work with Dougie Canfield, who I became very good friends with. We were quite good, close friends um, because of that show, I think, particularly. Um, and then I went on to do a, a, a Nightmare Man, The Nightmare Man, which is a science fiction thriller. Oh, yes, I've, I've, heard, I've heard of that. I've heard of that, yes. Yeah. Was that Patrick Madouin? No. Um, uh, was the lead in that, no? Uh, <clears throat> no. Uh. I can't remember who who the leads were now. Um, Morris Reeves was in it. Oh um, yeah, yeah. Um, that's a, that's gone out of my brain. Um, he was such a fabulous bloke to uh, both work with and know Dougie. Um, he did. I think he did fifty episodes of Doctor Who. Wow. Uh, when it was half hour episodes, I think he did fifty. I mean, of course, they were in three and four part. Well, yeah, four, yeah. Six, stories then um but he did quite a lot of stories uh he was a terrific director i learned so much from him the people said i've noticed in some interviews i've heard uh, with the actors that have worked worked with Doug, Doug, dougie you know said that he had and it reminds me of you a bit you know when you were when you were doing directing on on the 80s who and so on he had that he had a lot of he was a ball of energy as well apparently <laughs> he was and he loved doing the the, the much more action orientated stories, you know that that was kind of like the ones he loved. Yeah, he, he was very like he was really into that, you know that kind of yeah, style. Yeah, he had great vision. He was a uh, he was really good with actors um, uh, and listened. I I learned a big lesson <clears throat> from him that was he listened to people. He listened to all the experts. Uh, but he listened to actors. He he discussed properly with actors. They were a part of a conversation as opposed to talked to. Um, so what they had to say was taken in um, and they would be allowed, if it felt really good for him, they would be allowed to change bits of dialogue um, on, line, on set if it was obvious that it was necessary to do that. Um, whereas most of the time... Um, directors I work with would be saying, no, 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 don't change the dial. We've had lots of work on the script and uh, um, you, they protected the script. But sometimes you have to listen and, and things have to change because of circumstances that you hadn't seen on the day that made that absolutely perfect. 
the correct way of saying a di piece of dialogue. You worked on Warrior's Gate, and am I I'm right in saying, please, please fill me in on this, Graham, because I don't want to get this wrong. <laughs> but did you direct a little bit of that? Because it was something to do with Paul Joyce, who was the director. Um, did he get no, fired there's, or there's, something? Or? There's been lots of um, yeah. discussion about this. That's um, why I don't want to, I'd rather get, hear it from you, you know. I think yeah. leaks happen from the studio, or people watching in a gallery somewhere. You know, in the studios, they had viewing galleries so people visiting the street the cent television center could go up on the first floor and there were little viewing areas that you could look down into a set and hear what was going on on the tannoy system so you could hear what the floor manager was saying you couldn't hear the director but you could hear the floor man who was in the gallery but the floor manager on the on the floor would be saying right thanks thanks for everybody we're now moving on to such a scene and um, and then you'd hear this conversation, a one-way conversation, um, of um, him talking to the director. So you wouldn't hear what the director's saying as, he's, as the first got the earpiece. <clears throat> Sorry, excuse my cough. Um, but uh, when you visited, like lots of Doctor Who fans would go, who were in the centre would go to a viewing gallery overlooking Doctor Who, often they would hear a half-hearted part of what was going wrong and may have told that. So the truth of what happened was that um, Paul Joyce, um, who was the director of um, Warriors Gate, um, he, he'd written a play which had been made uh, and he directed, was allowed to direct it in Birmingham. But it was a play. Um, when you do a play, you have a lot more rehearsal time and it's, I wouldn't say it's more casual, uh, <clears throat> but you probably have a lot more assistance and a bit more time to make your play. Whereas Doctor Who, you have one day to do half hour. So you'd be in the studio for, a, a, if it was the weekend, Saturday and Sunday, and each day you'd make a half hour episode. That would be it. If you overran, you either picked it up the next, if you were doing another block the next weekend, <clears throat> another recording, uh, you'd have to pick it up there if it was possible. Right. So um, he was not used to planning and and writing a camera script. So and, and creating a camera plan showing where all the cameras were going to be in this, all the different sets on a big studio plan, which everybody needs to have in the studio. Um, and it was quite clear that he was never going to produce this camera script and camera plan um, because he wasn't experienced enough, but he was a very good director. He directed the actors. He had very good visual uh, sense of how it should look. So what happened was during the rehearsal period um, on the Monday of the, of the five day rehearsals before going to the studio, um, I as a first would have expected to have a camera plan and each day of rehearsals, he would finish off his camera script. And that is writing a shot list on, on the page, following the dialogue where he wanted to cut each shot, halfway through a line or at the end of each line or whatever. So a camera script that everybody in the studio, that's probably 30 or 40 people in the studio, would receive a camera script that had all the shots listed down that were going to be cut up as the story was made by a vision mixer. <clears throat> um, he didn't produce that, so we agreed that I would, I and I had my own job to do as a first, I had plenty to do, planning for, on his behalf, but I was now going to have to go, like on the Wednesday of that week, in the afternoon, watch every scene, <clears throat> and he would tell me um, the sort of, how he'd like to shoot it. Um, but I had to turn that into the camera. It's not that difficult, but it's a con but it's time consuming. Um, each shot would be uh, if you wanted a close up, you have to put on camera one close up of the actor, the character. Um, the next shot might be a wide shot, so that would be WS uh, of three people or, or the scene, or whatever. you'd have to write each shot on what size you want and what you're going to cover. So I. I watched his show 
and he would tell me after each scene what he how he roughly wants it to be shot and i took all that information home that night and i would write till three o'clock in the morning his camera script i wrote down what i thought he wanted um, because he didn't say wide shot, close up, whatever. He'd take groups. He would describe it to me, but I would have to work out how to, what to call that. <clears throat> and I wrote the whole of his camera script um, for the, and that was two episodes. So I'd do one on the Wednesday and one, no, Tuesday and one on the Wednesday. So that on the Thursday morning, I handed the camera scripts to uh, uh, the PA and she would type it up exactly as it was going to be. Um, and that's what I did. Um, I then ran the floor as a first assistant. And it was good that I ran the floor because I knew how everything was going to look and where everything should be because I'd planned it for him. Now, it went wrong because on the first day, he hadn't got the pace, the the, the right pacing to get through the amount of shots he had to get through by the lunchtime. And John Nathan Turner, the producer, was so worried, um, and I think with Barry Letts supporting him, they decided that he, Paul, would have to go. Uh, and then John said to me, do you want to come and direct? And I said, no fear. <laughs> I'm better off on the floor. I don't know how to run a gallery. It's better I'm on the floor. I know the floor. I know everybody on the studio floor. I know where everything is. I know what the problems are here. I will run it from the floor and you direct. Um, but by mid-afternoon, Paul had somehow come back and said, please, please let me carry on because I, I, I promise I can get through it. And he managed to get through both days and that was okay. Again, the same thing happened the next week. We did exactly the same thing. Um, and I did the camera script, etc. And uh, I think it was four episodes, that block, uh, that story. And... Um, Paul, again, I had the same problem the following weekend. Uh, he couldn't manage quite to get through it all in time, and they were very worried, so they asked him to go, and they would take over. And John took over the directing again, and I... But that was resolved very quickly at, by lunchtime, I think, and Paul was back. So he did actually direct the show. He did actually control what was from the gallery, what was going to happen. Um, <clears throat> my job was to help him put it on paper so that everybody knew exactly what was going on. That's the truth. His directing and the end product, product and how it looked, uh, you, you know, and the way, the energy and whatever, is down to him. Gotcha, Graham. It's just, yeah, it's interesting to know what, what happened there, definitely. Yeah, I'm glad you I mean, he, elaborated he, on that. Yeah, He was... His Paul's problem was that he didn't have the experience of being on the studio floor, well, in the studio, to get through the stuff, and it was quite complex what he was doing. And his dreams and visions were were new and and, and very interesting. So what he wanted to do was really interesting. It was actually being able to do it was the difficulty, um, but we managed and we got there and we got there together. So I did help him a bit more than probably was necessary. He should have, um, he should have been <clears throat> able to put a camera script together. Yeah. Um, so I'm sure he did after that. But uh, uh, it was a difficult time. But look, I I learned a lot from it. Um, I certainly don't begrudge him. I had to do it. I'm more worried that I was going to have the energy to get through the studio stuff because my job was doubled now. It was yeah. A really yeah. Hard time. Um, but the end result was wonderful. It's a very interesting story. Yeah, it was. Yeah. Yeah. No, it was good. And, and you yeah. know, he's part of that. Mm. Um, <clears throat> but then you did get your chance, you know, uh, uh, not too long after, we, where you, when you were uh, a director, you became a director, and you, of course, worked on, uh, which has now become, you know, it's top of the polls all the time, this story, you know, uh, uh, um, the case of Androzani. Do you think uh, so? I think it's <laughs> fading. Um, oh, is it? But it was. It was. It was. It was there for a long time. It was doing. It, really, it was very healthy. I was one of the, I, one of the you know, top tens and stuff like that. You know, I was really flattered um, yeah. 
particularly when I started the the new series, um, that that was still rated as a very um, high um, in a high position of being a you know one of the the good ones. Yeah. Um, I think it's been not back now because I've been the, the the modern series is is so good, and the opportunities to do things are so good on on the new series that um, I'm not surprised it's been not back. Yeah, <clears throat> but um, it it was a uh, yeah, it was a lot of fun. It was I was very nervous to do it. I'm sorry, I've got a terrible cough at the moment. <clears throat> You're all right. Um, um, it, was it was Peter Dav Peter Davison's swan song. Uh, you know, it was his last story, wasn't it, as the Doctor? Yes. And uh, I have seen uh, um, him quoting, you know, in, uh, late, in later years, that he really wished that um, his stories would have had more of that, you know, of Androzani. And uh, he, may have, he may have gone on for another year, had the stories and the action kind of thing, it, you know, continued into into that because he really enjoyed that, <laughs> that side of his character in that, you know? I'm um, laughing because yeah. he, uh, he, we did an interview together <clears throat> at a, a panel at a, a conference, uh, not at a conference, at a convention. And um, we were both talking about Androzani and at one stage uh, the the um, person interviewing both of us said, uh, so what did you, Peter, what did you think of Graham, um, this brand new director to Doctor Who, whilst you were making the show? And he said, well, we all think he was bonkers. <laughs> and I went, did you? Because uh, <laughs> I always had a good time with them all. I, I yeah. really, he said, no, we didn't. We couldn't understand how he, all it, it was all going to cut together the way you're doing. It didn't make <laughs> sense to us at all. And you know, but you were so excited, and you know, we had to go with you. But it did seem, you know, we thought you were nuts. <laughs> I mean, I've but, seen some, I've seen some like um, you know, st studio footage, like you know, like um, it, <laughs> that, that was found later on. It's been on the DVDs and stuff. It shows in studio you. On all fours, like you know, <laughs> going around the set and saying, and, and 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 you do it like this, and you're up, you're, you're really in the thick of it, you know, and it's it's fascinating to watch. I think uh, like, I you know, madly thought yeah. if I did it that I'd show if I did physically show what I wanted, not to the actors necessary, but to the crew, um, they would come up with the ways to actually shoot it because. They were big cameras, and I really wanted a handheld camera to be on the floor and you know, get up people's nostrils or whatever. You know, it was just just to get right in there. Um, I don't mean me, but the camera to be a so that you as a viewer were part of it and really in it. Um, they he did. They, I mean, I, I think they did think I was completely bonkers, but I th I never I don't remember a bad word being said. I I only remember it being a lot of fun to do. Um, because everyone was so willing to try and make this strange man's dream come true, which was me, the strange man. Um, no, it was a lot of fun. I learned, I didn't realise um, that they thought I was nuts. Um, uh, and I, but I did hear afterwards, and he said there that I regretted, he regretted not um, being able to stay a, a bit longer if the stories were going to be that good. Well, that was Robert Holmes. I mean, you know, we had Robert Holmes, this great writer, and this nut <laughs> trying to make it. Um, it obviously was a good combination because it, it did work. It was it was such fun to do. Am I right in saying that? Uh, uh, um, <clears throat> that uh, well, there's two stories that you've done, you know, the 80s ones. We'll get on to Revelation and the Daleks in a minute. But there were two heavyweight people that were going to be, were considered to be cast in these stories and one I believe I mean it became Christopher Gable um who was like the heavy in this Sharish Jack you know the character um but am I right in saying that um David Bowie was up for for that at one point they is that true well yeah. he wasn't up for it but we were up for him doing it yeah <laughs> we, we checked his um agents out yeah. Uh, to see whether he'd be free and would he could he, he I think somewhere along the line he said that he'd love to be uh, be in a Doctor Who story um somewhere in the Anza time um so we offered it to him through his agent but he was on a world tour 
There was no way he was going to break that or come back to play the villain in Doctor Who. So, um, and Mick Jagger was uh, um, uh, another thought, and that was out because he was touring. So we never really got a chance to seriously have that considered, which is interesting because I think uh, I think either of them could have been very interesting. The reason that happened was because John Nathan Turner and I both knew that whoever played that, although you were never going to see the real person's face, because when you did see it, it was all horrific and mangled like the Phantom of the Opera. Um, whoever was going to play that had to have eloquence and body language. Um, balletic was the expression I think I used, um, because that led me to Christopher Gable in the end. Um, uh, and and I and their voice they had to have a very very distinctive voice, um, which all three. So you had David Bowie, you had Mick Jagger's voice. If you listen to their voices, they're very interesting. Um, uh, and Mick Jagger mimics different people. I think when he speaks, uh, depends where he is and who he's talking to. He can put on a different way of speaking. Um, and Christopher Gable. Um, I, I'd got to know Christopher for six weeks doing a, a show as a runner. Here we are. Which was um, Music Down the Middle with Eric Robinson Presents. And he did a pas de deux with a different ballerina in this programme, which was a mixture of classical music and um, an opera and um, ballet. And he did a pas de deux every week um, on this show. And we were in Bristol. So we went down to Bristol for a weekend um, to every week for six weeks to do this programme. And um, Christopher was a bit older than me, <clears throat> but I got to know him very well. Um, we went clubbing together, would you believe, um, as young oiks um, in, in at that period. Uh, it was in the 60s, late 60s. And uh, I got to know him. Now, we didn't remain friends. We didn't see each other at all from that time till I became a director. Um, but I did bump into him occasionally uh, and we had such lovely times talking, etc. We got on very well. So I had a sort of in to get to him, well, not to get to him, but when he heard it was me directing, he really sat up and decided he would take an interest in considering it. And we met. He said, I want to come and talk about it because I can't understand how I'm going to play a part it's not exciting to play a part where you don't know who's behind the mask because when the mask comes off, you still you can't recognise who it is. So he said, um, uh, yeah, I want to come and talk about it and if you convince me, I'll come and do it. I did convince him, he did come and do it. <clears throat> but the reason why I thought he was wonderful, he has a lovely voice, a very distinctive voice, and then he has this elegance, which is from ballet, um, uh, uh, and it was just for, formidable. It was just the right person for the right job. And um, you know, in, an in, in an alternative universe, uh, Graham, wouldn't it be inter Wouldn't it have been fascinating to see what Bowie and Jagger would have done with it? Oh, know? yes. And um, by the way, uh, that's one of the reasons. <laughs> well, I am um, a big fan of Bowie. Yeah. Do you uh, know what's interesting? It's I mean, he was, he was great, though. I mean, he was a good actor, too. I've seen him in other things. He, Oh yes, he's a pretty good bloody actor, you know. Oh, as, yeah, a, no. as, as a as a performer, you know, as a singer, you know. He learned um, his craft. What I love yeah. is you putting shows Bowie. Um, we had uh, the Bowie base in uh, in um, the waters of Mars, um, and I I I was really yeah, I forgot about that. Yeah, that's a good, that was a that was an interesting reference. Yeah. That was a lovely yeah. reference to Bowie. Yeah, yeah. I, I was smashing. Uh, nice that was lovely. Yeah. Back. So whoever wrote that, I can't remember who wrote that. It must. have... Must have been a Bowie fan. Was that yeah. Russell that wrote that? I think. Uh, well, he, yeah, yeah, no, yeah. it was. It was a combination. Oh, so I'm sorry, it's gone right in my brain. I'm yeah, wondering. yeah, that's right. It was a joint. It was a joint oh, thing. Yeah, yeah. Phil Ford, I think it, it was. It was Phil Ford. That's it. Oh, yeah, yeah. What yeah. a lovely writer Phil Ford is. Yeah, it's terrific. Yes, of course it was. Yeah, yeah, but that's for another day. We're getting on to the, that. That's later on in the uh, the interview uh, when we get to Waters of Mars, uh, Graham. He'll be upset. <laughs> If he listens to this, he'll be upset. I forgot his name. Oh, that's okay. These things, yeah, good blimey, you've done so many things. That's the thing. You know, you, I can't, can't expect to remember everything. I, that's why I'm here to try and jog your memory, you know? You did. Uh, 
Um, but some of the other performances in in Androzani were there was a brilliant cast in there, Graham, wasn't there? Yes. I mean, you got Robert yeah. Glenister. He was terrific. Yeah. And he John played two iterations of himself. He played an Android version, and then the and himself. And the contrasts were really fascinating, you know. And because the other characters didn't know which one they were talking to, the audience kind of cottoned on a thing after a while, you know. But uh, um, it was interesting, all that kind of conniving, double bluffing going on, all that politics with John Normington. He was a right bloody creepy crawly, wasn't he? I mean, he was, you know, they were all trying to screw each other over in that, you know, for the for the drug, for the, the Spectrox thing and... It's interesting, all these, you know, it's very well written. There's all this um, internal politics going on. And, Margaret Well, Thatcher. you know, and as well as um, the main characters dying, you know, and uh, uh, the quest to save his companion, very heroically too, yes. I thought. Uh, while all this other stuff is going on, you know, it's it was really well structured, you know. Yes. Yeah. It was a, it was a fabulous script and... Uh... What was there was an interesting thing that happened in that, which was um, which is the the, the um, using the fourth wall, where John Normington um, looks at the camera, and um, how that came about was uh, accidental. Uh, it was um, uh, I remember the convention. John Nathan Turner saying to me, "Don't say that, tell a lie." Blah blah blah. Um, you, you, it was my idea. It wasn't my idea. The John Normington looking straight to camera to like Richard the Third saying, "Now is the winter about discontent." Uh, he, um, he, I. It was desperately late at night when we were doing this particular scene where he's at his desk looking at a hologram, I think, or uh, uh, talking to somebody, and the hologram had gone, and he turns and looks straight to the camera to say something um, to the camera, and. Uh, we were in serious trouble because of that because I didn't have time to retake that scene. And John Nathan Turner says, Oh, don't worry, we'll make a virtue of it. Um, because I'd said to the floor manager, production manager on the floor, would you say to John, when he looks towards camera, don't look into it, but look to the side, the right hand side, his right hand side of the lens? I don't know why I said that, but I remember saying something like that. And John, he t he told John whatever he said, and John Normington turned and did straight to the camera again, or that, or he did it straight to the camera for the first time, and I couldn't retake it. Um, so John said, John Nathan Turner said to me, "Look, uh, we'll make a virtue of it because um, actually I find it quite interesting." So that became what John did every now, every time he had a conversation with somebody, he would turn around and tell the audience, I'm not going to let him get away with that. I'm going to murder him. He'll be finished soon. Um, and that became this marvellous moment in the episode, purely by accident. Anyway, there we are. And then he, and then he goes and then pushes um, poor bugger down the, down the lift shaft. Oh, yes. <laughs> you know? I mean, he's a, he's, bloody, he's, murder, he's a murderer as well, as well as... A, and he was careful. He was, yes, it was... Um, how he removed he removed the, the floor, I guess, at some point. Yes. Yeah, and then he, just like offers his hand, and then shoves him. You know, yeah, down. well, he he knew the lift. He, oh, I think he, I think the, the 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 president it was had pressed the button for the lift to come up, and I think Normington, be without him seeing it, pressed the button to make it go away again or something, and then pushed him out because the yeah. lift is now on the ground floor. He was a right. He was a nightmare, really. I, actually, he I think he. I was siding with Sharis Jack by the end of it. I thought Normington <laughs> was worse than him. You know. He was more of a rotter, you know. He was. Bit, really. Yeah. <laughs> he was playing everyone off, wasn't he? Yeah, until an interesting twist at the end where yes. the, the, the secretary actually gets rid of him. That, that's brilliantly done. She that takes over written. a big cigar in her hand. Yeah. Oh, no, I don't think she had a cigar. I love that. Yeah, yeah. Why are you, are you sitting at my desk? He says. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm not going to yeah, That was lovely, that was. So you got, so you got his comeuppance, you know. Yeah. Um, but the, the I love the frenetic pace that you created with that, particularly um, toward the end. You know when uh, we're get we're getting near the end of the Davison's. You know uh, uh, he's he's ill. He's um, desperate to save his friend Perry. Um, the clock's ticking. 
and there's explosions going off everywhere, and he's trying to get back to the TARDIS. So there's all these stakes, you know, raised. And, of course, we get to the regeneration scene. Was that very fraught that day, uh, Graham, on, on set? I think uh, it was, was, was it Because, obviously, there's nerves going on everywhere. You've got the new guy coming in, Colin Baker. Uh, Peter's leaving, so uh, he would have been in a different kind of mindset. What what was it? What do you remember about that? I I remember it being very desperate for time because I suppose it's partly due to me as well. But but the effects and what we were trying to do was so complicated. It, well, they weren't com well. They were complicated to get in the time we didn't have in the studio. That's the problem. There was no, you, you had one day per episode. Can you imagine? And there's so much going on and explosions and fires and and. God knows what. Um, <clears throat> to get to the end and still have half an hour, a decent amount of time to do the regeneration. Um, and the regeneration was quite complicated by the swirl of um, all the assistants that had been for Peter Davison, all going round in his brain, telling him the various things, etc., are going to happen. And then the master laughing his way through showing that he's still around and still going to be a foe and you're finished, my old son. Um, these were complicated effects for the time. Not now, but for that time, to get quickly was very difficult. Um, and my ambition was too was bigger than was possible. Um, and then to get Colin in and get him in the right position to take over and sit up um, you know, and again, get get the positions right so they could be matted in together quite neatly. That was desperate, and I don't know how much time we had left at the end of it. Was left to the end of the day, of course, um, and I don't know how we managed to do it. But we, I was desperate on the floor, trying to explain to them briefly, fast and quick as possible what I was trying to achieve. Um, but I managed. I remembered it was. There was no anger or panic. There was probably panic from me, but there was no... Uh, everybody was ready and prepared and trying to grasp, ev hang on to everything I was saying to make it work. Um, and it did. And we managed. Um, but I, I don't know what it was like for Colin Baker. He'll have to tell you himself um, and what he was feeling about it. But knowing Colin, he would oh, let them all panic and fluff. I'm no good. I'm going to do, and this is what I'm going to do, and I'm going to do it this way. And he did, and we managed, and it was fine. And of course, you worked with Colin, you know, for the for the next story. Yes, um, that was fun. This time, it was written by Eric Sayward, who written yes. several scripts uh, for Doctor Who, and he was a, he was a script editor as well for a while as well, I believe. Yeah. Yes, he was at that time, I think. But, yeah, that's right. And but he did write a couple of stories as well. Yeah. This being one of them, and uh, um, uh, uh, and you got to work with the Daleks, yes, and Davros. So yes. um, interesting, you know, the, the 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 full shebang there, you know, um, and an interesting pre premise going on, where it's this uh, place called, um, I believe it's called Tranquil Repose. Is that right? Yeah. Tranquil, tranquil, you've got to say it with your teeth in. Tranquil repose, yes. Tranquil repose. Yeah, I can't. <laughs> Get your put teeth back, in. And me. Put them back in, yeah. <laughs> uh, um, and uh, so it, it, it's, um, remind me, Graham, or, 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 or I'm not sure, I'm, I might have to remind you. I'm, 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 some things are a bit, it, some, some things are a bit of a grey area for me too, but um, uh, it, it, it was a place. A it was planet. like a few, a few. It was like a funeral. Uh, um, yes, directors Tranquil. or something. Is that right? Kind no, of futuristic, the, but planet yeah. is Necros. Yeah, and it is, and on Necros there is this planet. There's this um, place called Tranquil Repose, which is a a huge uh, building, an empire, where they cryogenically um, uh, suspend people's lives so that um, medicine can be created and later um, they can be given, be regenerated, if you like, and brought back um, and made healthy and um, live wonderful lives or whatever. Um, but in fact, it was um, they were cannon fodder, really, for something else much more evil going on and lots of money being made, etc. Obviously, it's all about power. Um, uh, and it was, um, yes, 
I mean, it's very, it's quite a complicated story because there are other people trying to get. Um, this, sorry, I'm being very vague and um, awful, but it's a, it's it's all about power and money as usual. It, most most things are, aren't they? Sadly, you know. <laughs> yes. In, in life, so, generally, yeah, yeah. yeah right, that, yes, that, and also, um, it's, and it's also. Uh, Davros is now involved with uh, uh, it's a horrible story yeah. um, and there are horrible things that happen within it and um, I don't know how we got away with what we did get away with because again I'm not sure you'd be allowed to do or show quite what we showed in that there was there was a terrific um, amount of fight against Mrs Whitehouse fighting against the, the violence that was shown in all sorts of programmes not just Doctor Who but particularly Doctor Who, because a lot of young people watched it. Um, <clears throat> but I think today, it's a strange mixture I have of feelings about it. Today, um, we see much more violence than we ever showed in Doctor Who in those days. But at the time, uh, there was a huge fight against the stuff that I was trying to do, um, which probably was right. They they were probably right. We shouldn't be seeing. Do you remember? There's um, uh, is it? St I can't remember his name now. There's a professor, step Professor Stengos, is it? Who becomes? He's been put into the shanks, the body of a Dalek, and he's becoming the brain of a Dalek. And you see, um, his face in amongst the gubbins of a Dalek, a blue Dalek which I wanted to do is translucent so you can see right through into the body of it. Um, and I think it was quite terrifying what we did, the way we showed that. Um, but I think now we show it even more horrifically. I think uh, we get away with much more now. And yet sometimes I hear my saying we wouldn't get away with that anymore. But that's usually to do with the health and safety of something, of how to achieve it, I suppose, yeah. I've stopped. Got, there's, there's, a bit, there's a bit of body horror in it too. You know, you've got like um, you know, uh, um, the guy's leg being blown off, or, you know, and, <laughs> and Davros's fingers being shot off, and you know, there's a couple of there's a couple of moments there where we think, blimey, pretty grim, you know, yes, yeah. <laughs> you know, so. I'm laughing, and not not because because they're horrific. I'm laughing because we, well, how do we get away with that? <laughs> it's more cynical than um, I, you know, they're they're shocking, and I don't. I don't really relish all that, um, but I suppose at the time I just felt we should see the horror of what's actually going on. Um, you need to see it, but uh, maybe not as graphically as I was trying to show. And again, again, an inter interesting cast in it too, Graham. You know, you got uh, 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 Clive Swift, yes. who's this really vain. Uh, um, yes. If you, uh, 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 what would you, uh, what would be his character? I'm trying to think what kind of character he would be. Um... Well, vain. I think he's popular. He was very vain. vain. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and um, yeah. and thinks he's in control. He thinks he can fight against um, Davros. I mean, uh, the man's a fool. Yeah. Yes, very vain. <laughs> Tassen Beaker, who's um, um, very very soft and gentle, and and wants to help her boss. Until the end, she realised he's evil and horrible, and horrible to her. Mm. But she's, of course, under c the control of Davros for power because she wants power as well. Yeah. And then you've got uh, uh, people like, you know, uh, uh, Alexis Sale in it as the DJ and, and all that, you know. There's... <laughs> it's in funny. Fact, about... That was an interesting kind of character to throw in there, you know. It yeah. was... <laughs> I, I really loved him, but I have to tell you, when, I've said this before um we when we were rehearsing every when you have a rehearsal period you'd rehearse on dot who it would be five days of rehearsal on the fourth day you did a technical run through for the technicians so they knew what was going to happen in the studio and then on the friday you'd have the producers run john nathan turner would come and watch the episode or the two episodes you're going to do and then he'd give notes of what he thought might be improved, not quite working, or, you know, can we also add this? And he would give notes, and I'd have to tell the the artist what he'd said, you know, and um, and why what we could do to improve it, and we'd rehearse those moments again or whatever. 
when we got when John came, it's now Friday, so we're in the studio the next day. When Alexis Sale did his uh, his moments, he just did them flat as if he was reading them. So there was no energy or nothing. It was just this um, Liverpudlian voice um, pronouncing his dialogue, but not any energy, no performance whatsoever. And at the end, John, when we had the producer's notes on my own, I'd have them with the artist would go for a cup of tea for half an hour, and I'd talk through with John, and John said, I'm terribly worried. What are we going to do about Alexius? Alexius O. And I said, how do you mean? He said, but he's not... He's not going to play it like that, is he? He said, no, I, I wouldn't. Do, but I'd never really seen a performance, ever. I have to tell you. He said, I'm really concerned, Graham. I think we're going to have to recast. I said, how can we recast? He said, well, but, but he, uh, he, we can't have that. And I said, I don't think you're going to get that. I think we're going to get something wonderful. He said, but oh, we're never going to know till the day. I said, no, I suppose we're not. I'm, I'm going to have to control it on the day then. So he said, oh, I'm really worried. But he went, he trusted me about it and he went. So I said to Alexi, John's very worried because he hasn't seen exactly how you're going to play this. Are you going to play it like that? But I know in my heart, you're not going to play it like that. And he said, well, of course I'm not going to play it like that, Graham. I'm saving my performance for the camera. But when we're in the studio, so we went into the studio and Alexi played this fantastic, mad, over-the-top, wonderful character, which is needed. I think it balances out the programme because they're all a bit mad in the show anyway. I mean, Cara and um, her psychic, um, the two men, you know, uh, the swashbucklers, <laughs> uh, Don Quixote and, his, and, and, uh, and, and his psychic. I mean, it's... The, 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 it, I think Alexi's performance is just stunning. It's a lot of fun. And he's a hero. And he's a very likeable hero. And John was really thrilled. When he saw what he was going to eat, why, why didn't he show us? And I said, well, he said he didn't want... To. A lot of actors do that. They don't give everything until the camera. Um, but, of course, by the time you get to know actors, you know that that's what they're going to do. You can imagine how they're going to be. And and most of the time that's going to work. So you have to trust. Yeah, you do. You do. And I'm going to be sued, aren't I? He, he switched it on when it, when it was necessary. Oh, yeah. no, he was, uh, I, in yeah. my heart. I knew he was he, funny. He was very, because also he was playing all these different characters in it, wasn't he? Yes. As well, you know, every time you saw him, he had like, he was like dressed he as a rocker a, or something. A he, was, he, he, he was all different things going on in it, you know. Yeah, yeah, I think he was. Well, he could, but also you have to think of the character. He's talking to the dead. <laughs> 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 He's got to get something out of it. <laughs> <laughs> it was. He, I loved yeah. it when, I, when he when he did it. I oh, I was so relieved. Yeah. It was so fun to. to he was a fun character. And and I thought um, Nicola Perry uh, Perry's character would have just loved that man, which she did. She just loved being with he him. Did she was absolutely fascinated by him, wasn't she? Yeah, no, it was a character, you know. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Wonderful character. Yeah, it was a great, and it was a great story. It was. It's up there with the the best, you know. I think very complicated. Um, yeah, there was an awful lot going on. An awful yeah. lot of different things going on. Different. Different character arcs and all sorts of things, yeah. But, I just um, wanted to make it as intriguing, all of it, all the horror, all the the the, the bit with Stengus's head in the Dalek, which I think is terrifying. Um, all the I just wanted it to be when I say colourful, um, even the horrific side, lots of exciting visuals as much as I could to really help the story because I thought the story was fabulous. But complex, complex to make sure you everybody understood what was going on from a director's point of view. Mm. <clears throat> <I> stop, <laughs> sorry. Some time, some time passed. Uh, you know, from, um, from doing Revelation of the Daleks to being approached again for doing. It was the it was an, the anniversary coming up, uh, um, the thirtieth anniversary in nineteen ninety three. And I think they wanted to do something for that. Uh, um, and something did kind of 
was kind of happening, but then it didn't. You know, uh, um, yeah. I think it got into uh, it. It it progressed quite a quite a way before it got pulled, and it was called Lost in or it, the Dark Dimension or Lost in the Dark Dimension uh, of the title, which was going to bring back all the Doctors um, up to that point. So you know, up to Sylvester McCoy. Um, and you were ta- you were mooted to direct it. Now, what do you remember about that, uh, Graham? How far, how far advanced was it at that stage? Had it uh, all been written? And what what went wrong? What why did, it, why did it never happen? So, yeah, the script was written. Um, I was approached to make the thing. I was contracted. Um, it was me- being made by. BBC Enterprises Department, which is now is now worldwide, it's called. But well, it, I don't know what it's called now, but it, it then became worldwide. <clears throat> but Enterprises decided um, uh, they would put the money up. Um, they thought anyway um, for a, a, a 30th anniversary DVD. Um, I was contracted. Um, so was. Tom Baker. I don't know who else was. Um, There was a producer. There were two producers, in fact. Alan Yentob um, got to hear about it being made and said he wanted to put so much money into the production for a viewing on BBC. Um, But it was really going to be straight to DVD. Um, Yentob got involved and it was going to be made... There'll be certainly one showing on television. Um, and uh, that helped bump the money up to be able to make it. Um, and I joined the uh, production and I think I was sat in a desk planning for about four or five weeks. Um, we were starting to approach all the actors that were being required. We were going to approach Rick Mail to play Hawks, well, Hawks Moore, who was the... Um, main uh, villain of the story, um, which would have been really exciting because I always felt Rip Mail was a terrific actor, had huge potential to become a major star. I have to say, I just have to cut in here, Graham, and say, I always thought, I always thought that he would have made a great doctor. Yes. I I can see that, the eccentricity. He's got a bit of a dark side as well. I could. Say, I think he could have pulled that off, you know. The way David Tennant played uh, the Doctor, the pace at which he played some of the, the long speeches, Rick would definitely have been able to do that, um, play that kind of manic but exciting and forward-thinking and exciting kind of person with lots of energy. Um, <clears throat> yes, I agree with that. Um, what happened was, well, I think there were two things that happened. One, the BBC didn't know or didn't seem to know that Spielberg's company, Amblin Films, um, were either up... Well, I don't know how far down the road they were with the rights to Doctor Who, but they were definitely angling to get the rights of Doctor Who, to which I know they got, because eventually Stephen Siegel, who, um, uh, who was working, I think, at one stage for Amblin, managed to obtain the rights. He seemed to have the rights. So I have a thing. I don't know what the story is, but he yeah, eventually... Uh, Philip, Philip Seagull. Yeah. Did Philip, I... What not I Stephen. Said Stephen. Stephen's, Stephen. The, Stephen's that actor, yeah. Sorry, Stephen. <laughs> <clears throat> I, just thought, I, I just thought I'd cut in there and let you... No, yeah, Phil, so it was that. right. Philip Seagull. Um, yeah. he, he eventually had the rights. So I think that was through Amblin, but I don't... I actually don't know. So... Um, but there seemed to be a bit of a jiggery poker going on with the rights. At the same time, the BBC were making this film, so I didn't. I think that started to put. Um, I think there were litigation. Going, it was. I'm sorry, I'm saying this terribly badly. I think there was some form of litigation going on there, and that's the main reason why I think it got stopped. Um, but certainly. Um, the BBC drama department had a big say in that as well, and it was it was stopped. Um, I was paid off, and um, that was the end of the story for me. And I guess the same for Tom. Um, 
How far had it gone down financially in other roads? I've no idea. I don't know what happened. And I was just asked to step down and that was the end of it. And that was the end of the show. And then three years later, there was the show that Philip Seagull made, so which was the film. Um, yeah. And that yeah. was the end of it. It's a shame. It's a real shame because the story was a really good, complex story. As far as the other doctors were concerned, <laughs> um, I don't I don't think they were in full knowledge um, of what was expected of them. It was quite complex. No one was talking to them properly, from what I can understand. Um, and I think there were complications and they weren't all happy about being in it. So, uh, you know, it was sort of semi-doomed before I ever got started, to be honest. So, so yeah, sad, sad opportunity kind of lost there, really, I guess. It was because yeah. I thought... Um, because Adrian... the alternative was that we got Dimensions in Time, uh, you know, the, uh, the Children in Need special thing, um, which was not the greatest story, uh, really. It certainly wasn't that story. Yeah, the, the, I, I, the, the original story was uh, was a terrific story. Yeah, I know. But what I mean is, the only thing we got for the thirtieth anniversary was, was that thing. You yes, know, the yeah. Need. Yeah. Uh, um, so that, that that's you know. Uh, Isn't it fascinating though? The premise that... of it was good. It was for charity. Can't knock it for that. But story wise, not great. You know. Um, but isn't it interesting though that um, throughout since. 89 when it stopped right through to 2005 it never stopped there was there was something going on about doctor who all the time and lots of fights for it to be brought back but it was being kept alive all those years one way or another with all the different things that were happening um right th through till eventually russell t davis managed to persuade the bbc to revive it all and take him on to show run it extraordinary but it was it never died which is no, lucky it was kept it, alive by the fans in many ways yeah. um, oh, people, yeah. you know novels and uh, uh audio dramas which is still going now big finish and stuff like that yeah. uh and also fans doing um you know a, a spin-off made for video productions yeah. you know that maybe not were licensed you know some of them but they were still carrying the torch, you know, through yeah. those years, which is so. It, it was, yeah, it never it never died in the, in the interim, really. No, it was uh, someone they, was doing something all the time. Yeah, right? yeah. fascinating. Yeah, um, which brings us neatly now to um, where we're going to stop for this part, Graham, um, because we are now we've gone from the classic years uh, uh, that you, you you were involved with. Now we're going into modern who as it were when it came back in 2005 for you know the, the relaunch for want of a better word <laughs> uh, uh, uh led by russell t davis his first his first time at the helm now of course he's back again for another run but um this was this was new who um uh, looked very different very fresh found a, a new audience and took off again you know um, so what I'd like to do is, and you were involved quite quite a lot with certainly with David Tennant's Doctor, um, directing quite a few, many classic stories actually. So we'd like I'd like to talk with you about that, and working on the Sarah Jane adventures with D dear Liz Sladen, and uh, and uh, um, and uh, what you what you're doing currently. So what we'll do, Graham, I think is uh, for the for the audience here and for for us. We need a little. I think we need some liquid refreshment, um, and um, <laughs> I haven't got any alcohol, so it's just tea. Oh, I have. Me, yeah. <laughs> but the, um, so we're going to take. We're doing a bit of time travel. We're taking a break for about 10, 15 minutes, but you'll see us in about seven days after this first <laughs> part. So <laughs> you weird stuff going on there, yeah. So, um, thank you, Graham so much for this for this, this chat for the first part we'll be back guys in part two where we're going to go into modern who and we're going to talk about that with graham so until then um stay tuned we'll see you shortly